Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He's speaking to us from Arizona. Mark, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Jim. Do we have a special offer for our listeners? Let's continue the special offer. We're starting to get some calls on it, so that's good. But on our newsletters, the promo code is 2022 half off, just as it sounds. 2022-H-A-L-F-O-F-F, and you go to vrtrader.com, which is the shortcut in the Leibovit VR newsletters, and uh, you can take advantage of any uh, the newsletters for any time frame that, um, that interests you. So, uh, again, 2022 half off at vrtrader.com, and as I usually do, I like to make that disclosure that I'm not a financial advisor, nor do I provide financial advice. We are publishers. The U.S. administration has banned the import of Russian uranium. What kind of an impact is that going to have on prices? That's interesting. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how much we use relative to what we produce. Uh, so, twenty percent, twenty percent of the uranium used in U.S. reactors comes from Russia. Right. When you think about it, uh, since there's so much anti-Russian sentiment in the Democratic Party here in the United States for so many years, going back to Hillary Clinton and so forth, you know, you wonder why we even were doing any business with Russia with regard to uranium. You know, the fact that uh, we had these war- warmongering attitude against uh, Russia going way back and still now. And, uh, you know, it's, um, I don't know, it's uh, surprising that he even had that much. So you would think that it would... Uh, support prices. I know a lot of the stocks that represent them, like Cameco, which is a big name uh, here in the U.S., and, you know, had a big run and looks a little copy to me on a trading basis. So it might have been discounted, honestly. That's what would be my reading on it. Uh, most of the U.S. uranium comes from Wyoming, and I would suspect a lot comes from Saskatchewan. Okay. Well, apparently we're meeting the needs now, but the big the big question is why we had the big run to begin with. I mean, uranium has been in the doldrums for, you know, got to be 10 years or more, particularly since the uh, Sh- U- U- Shuka- Yukushima, I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly, incident in Japan, the anti-uranium sentiment, the anti-nuclear sentiment. Then suddenly uranium took off, and you don't see, at least in the U.S., except for Georgia, uh, any great movement to uh, build nuclear reactors. And I know elsewhere in the world that's the case, but the price of uranium really was subdued until about a year, year and a half ago. And um, it's just amazing it took off. Maybe because of the Russian anticipation of the Russian cutoff, we had the big move up, and maybe we already saw the uh, discounting of that effect. But it was, it was a big question in my mind. You know, if, if everybody's building nuclear reactors here, that you, you could substantiate it. I don't have a count what's being built in China or in other places around the world. I know many are, but that would be useful in trying to determine how much future demand we really have for uranium. And this doesn't have to do with military uses or other uses, you know. So we know uh, submarines and battleships and all kinds of U.S. uh, military apparatus uses uh, nuclear, including some of the solar, um, not solar, space uh, space enterprises. So... um, the chart looks a little toppy to me, honestly, on the uranium. Just had a big run, but uh, as far as uh, you know, what the future is here, you know, I'm a big bull on it. I think that's your really your solution. I mean, I love crude oil, I love solar, I love wind power, I love all this, but that's never going to be enough to supply the demand 
the only real solution is nuclear. We actually need to have a fission or fusion reactor in our automobiles. <laughs> that would solve the problem altogether, like you saw in the science fiction film Back to the Future. We need to become more independent off uh, you know, extracting things from the ground, whether it's uh, uranium or uh, oil or whatever. It would be great if it, we can derive all the energy we needed from nuclear or solar, and uh, that would be the cleanest uh, solution. Of course, there's a lot of talk of modular atomic power plants, uh, very small ones that could power a small city or a neighborhood. But I think you run into nimbyism, not in my backyard. Right. We don't want any nuclear. The fear of uh, a Chernobyl, you know, or a Fukushima type event, you know, rings strong in everyone's mind. They're going to get the next one to get fried. And yes, there there is chance of accidents. There's no question about it. But so uh, uh, technology will solve that problem. It's a matter of time. So, Well, let's hope the plant's not built by Boeing or the doors will fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have Boeing be the contractor in charge is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, as they say, Boeing became obsessed with profits. It used to be a company that made quality aircraft and uh, the first 707, the test pilot rolled it. it. was never designed to do that, but he wanted to show how durable the airplane was. I I bet you they're not rolling their 777s or 787s or 757s. I guess not. I guess not. Tell me a little bit about that. You're, I know you're an airline aircraft expert, so what was well, the well, no, he, that they he, utilized? Well, no, they just had the test pilot... Uh, just totally stunned the crowd and his bosses by rolling an airliner. And I've also heard from other pilots that uh, they've actually, when they're on deadhead, like returning airliners, they've done some stunts with them that uh, their bosses wouldn't approve either. So I guess back in the old days, they knew how to make aircraft. But now everything's made out of plastic. And how durable is your dishwasher even, or your fridge? It's going to break in three years. It's made out of plastic. It's built to break. So it sounds like in previous years, the tests were more aggressive and uh, dramatic than we were doing today. If we did those today, maybe we would have seen the problem with the doors and so forth ahead of the incident. Huh? Sure. Uh, well, yes, more robust testing. But again, now things are built to meet government minimums. Not what you know. Not what you think. So they want to save as much weight as possible for fuel economy. That's their their number one goal. Uh, passenger comfort doesn't seem to be a concern. Reliability doesn't seem to be a concern. Boeing's own uh, research found that uh, their seven thirty seven Max would be involved in at least thirteen what they called serious incidents over its lifetime. Well, that's 13 plow ins. Two accidents killed well over 300 people. Uh, again, it's like the Ford Pinto. Uh, they didn't put a plastic liner in the gasoline tank to save $7. That's $21 million that they saved because they were selling $3 million a year. They knew people would burn to death because of it. It's called risk management. Boeing was doing the same thing with the lives of the people who fly in their airplanes. It's really amazing. It's really yeah. amazing that uh, that, that that's, that this even happens. You know, that all the technology and all the expertise and engineers involved. It's amazing to me. But yeah, and these are all from yeah, lawsuits. These aren't made up numbers. They just knew they wanted to, the Pinto. They wanted to sell a car for under three thousand. Where did they save the money? The device that would keep it from blowing up if it was rear-ended. Crazy stuff. Now, uh, is cannabis any closer to being legalized in the U.S.? And, and would that mean you could have interstate sales? Well, a lot has to happen. It's a very complicated issue. Ultimately, we need a congressional act, you know, passed by both houses of the U.S. Congress, saying marijuana is legal. But well, ultimately, that's what has to happen. And it, it doesn't appear that's happening anytime soon. The EA rescheduling it from one to three. That they're sending it out for comments right now. The comments could be anywhere from two days to two years until they all come back. And that's just one piece of the puzzle. And then we've got the the bank U.S. Cannabis Banking Act, which has been stalled in Congress for the last several years, which opens up the banking and financial aspects of uh, cannabis, which is restrictive. You know, it's considered an illegal substance. And I don't think rescheduling it down from one to three changes that because the IRS has its own views about running an illegal business, even though some states are illegal. We need what happened in Canada across the board 
legalization. And it's just not happening. It's like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So everybody's excited about the DEA rescheduling, but we still have the Banking Act issues. And, um, you know, even today, uh, the last few weeks, uh, I think I mentioned on a previous interview that we're uh, in the state of New Mexico, uh, uh, which is legalized cannabis in the state. Uh, rests were made for people uh, moving cannabis around. And it was the feds ignored the state law, and there was this unofficial act or um, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, edict called the Cole Memorandum that I think it was even initiated when Obama uh, was in president, president where if a state has legalized that fed, you know, hands off in those areas. For some reason, the feds in New Mexico decide to get aggressive and say, well, even though it's legal here, we're going to go after you anyway. So it's such a circus. It's so tough to answer your question. Mm. I mean, the bottom line is there are a lot of U.S.-based cannabis Related companies, um, the biggest one I think, or one of the biggest, is Truly, and uh, has big operations in Florida. Are making money, you know, whether it's CBD or whatever they're doing, they're profitable, which was not the case for the Canadian companies for many years, and it's still not the case. And uh, some of these companies buying back their own stock, and uh, even though they're well off their highs, you know, financially they seem to be doing okay. Um, so that's sort of a plus. Uh, but um, you know, as far as cross state um, commerce and, uh, you know, idiots like in New Mexico that's hard to go after uh, cannabis, even though it's statewide legal, uh, the Banking Act issue. I mean, there's so many floating pieces here. It's just crazy. And, we, you know, will Congress ever sit down and say, hey, we're going to just legalize uh, cannabis nationally, clear the slate and move on? And that just really needs to happen. It's not happening. So uh, this could we're getting a lot of trades in the stocks. You know, little rumors come out or stories or Joe Biden says something or, uh, um, you know, the vice president says something, Harris, and the stocks, you know, pop for a day or two. Um, you know, this could, uh, you know, this could, this could drag on. This could be like the Federal Reserve uh, story here in the U.S. where everybody's anticipating lower interest rates, a bunch of them don't happen. Then they reduce it to less uh, anticipation participatory rate hike, you know, rate lowerings. And now we're even hearing there could be a rate hike. So with the anticipation of what's coming and the same thing with the cannabis could be different than what happens. What if, you know, the comments are bad or they start, start, start to get rejections to the idea of rescheduling or passing the Banking Act for political reasons. Some Republicans don't like it or some, you know, Democrats don't like it either or the Democrats seem to like it more for thinking that's going to get them reelected. I mean, there's all this uh, mishmash. It, it's uh, it's a circus. I mean, honestly, uh, ultimately, it'll it'll happen only because you know there's more demand over time, and there's medical reasons why it shows benefits. Uh, uh, you know, but you know, my own view is it it should be used medically. I mean, I'm not a big proponent of everybody out there uh, using uh, THC, whether they smoke it or whether they take a liquid. I just think it um, you know dumbs. Down down the country. I mean, it's like, you know, it, 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 you could almost have a conspiracy theory about it. Is they want cannabis everywhere, so everybody is, is drugged up and uh, they're, they're more complacent and they follow government orders. I mean, you can know, go that far with the uh, idea that, you know, having it around. And it is a, you know, an entry-level drug. There's no question about it. I mean, people could start on cannabis and uh, be heroin addicts in five years. I mean, anything could happen. So there is a reason for it. But then you could argue the same thing, you know, for cigarettes or liquor. And, you know, ultimately it comes down to individual control and the ability to manage your own life with regard to the use of any substance. So, um, I mean, for myself, I don't even take, you know, prescription medication. I don't believe anything that, well, for the most part, anything drug companies come up with because of all the ancillary or negative, potential negative effects of these drugs. So, you know, for myself, my own body, you know, I'm not going to take any, choose about anything. I'm on any drug at all. It's supposed to be, I'm supposed to be taking some blood pressure medicine and I'm um, 75 years old and I'm in pretty good shape. So, you know, uh, I definitely didn't take a COVID shot or never would take any of those type of shots. I never even taken flu shots. I took an influenza shot. I can tell you that because I had a cut and bruise one time. I had to take it. But so I'm um, so anti-substance anyway. I don't smoke. I really don't drink, you know, maybe occasional wine, a glass of wine. So, you know, I think ultimately uh, the availability out there in a dumbed-down public, 
And unfortunately, there's so many dumb people out there. You can just tell by the fact who they elected for president in this country. But as far as uh, <laughs> that's concerned, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really a big proponent of it. I got involved because the stocks were trading opportunities. And being a capitalist, you know, whatever it is, it just seemed like a way to make some money. In the 2014, 2015, I got behind it and uh, has big ups and downs. It's still some more or less down, but trying to come out of a bottom. So what you got to do is trade the stocks. And so we have them on our list on and off. Recently, we sold them here a few days ago, had a nice profit in a few of them. And I'm looking for another entry point, and I'm trying to wait for the charts to tell me that. And hopefully, uh, whether it's co- coincident with some news announcement or it just happens anyway, technically, only uh, time will tell. I have a feeling that it's going to be sort of lackluster through the summer. I think it's just going to not do anything for during the summer months. I think probably something in the fall, it might be the time where you might see the cannabis uh, stocks take off again. But uh, stay tuned to our VR cannabis letter, and we'll keep you posted. We'll have more with Mark Leibovit right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mark Leibovit. Mark, what's happening with gold? A little bit of a pullback. Got overdone. Um, big gaps on the chart. Everybody got excited. So it's uh, in a corrective phase. And uh, I'm holding on because I have this $2,700 gold target over the near term. And silver, I think, can go much, much higher. And I just think the psychology has changed. Plus, you got central bankers out there, you know, buying gold. And uh, I just think, uh, you know, it's a good hold. You know, I, uh, as a trader, you know, it, it was a sale a couple of days ago to repurchase. And uh, that's that's pretty much the story. So I just think you got to weather, you know, weather the times. I mean, if you, if you haven't been in it before, you're buying it at this uh, 2300 level. I mean, obviously, considering you could have bought all you wanted at 15 or 1600 the last couple of years, that's uh, that's a whole other you know perspective to take. You could have to decide are you trading this thing day to day. So as a trading comment, I think there's a little buy coming up here. The charts say we're in a little bit of a downtrend along with the overall stock market and. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you jump in on, on when some of these gaps are filled and, you know, when some of the uh, exuberance that we saw at the recent peak is exhausted. So uh, we're in the process of doing that now. They're pulling back here a little bit. So I would hang in there. I mean, I think uh, state of the world and what uh, central banks are doing and, and uh, I think is in our favor. So you got to decide what your timing is all about. Are you trading or are you taking the view that we're going to 2700 or possibly even to 10000 as, as uh, you know, money printing uh, goes the way of the dodo. <laughs> and we find out that uh, our, you know, the government and the financials are so messed up, plus the, the influence of the BRIC nations and their desire to uh, control international commerce and back a currency by gold or long-term positives. So, again, it's a question of what's your time frame. I'm, we're, I'm holding positions, but... As a trader, I'm saying if I haven't bought any, I'd wait for a little bit more of a pullback. What's going on with crude? Same thing. Uh, got overdone, but, but more before crude oil, well, before gold topped out. This happened in the last uh, couple of weeks. We had a little bit of a you know trading top there, and I'm just looking at the charts now. We're just in a corrective phase here. A big bull on crude oil, but the uh, charts say we're in a uh, you know a bit of a correction. So. Uh, Again, what is your time frame? I mean, I'm holding names like Occidental Petroleum because Warren Buffett's involved and a big picture view. Uh, you know, we're probably headed up uh, close to $200 in um, crude oil in the next few years. So, um, you know, pick the ones that are the stocks that pay the dividend. That would be the number one uh, advice, you know, being something that at least could give you some type of return while you're waiting. Um, and the trade, uh, still a little bit of a correction here. So just stay tuned to our... Um, newsletter for you know comments there about a little new uh, re-entry point but uh, uh still overall philosophically bullish you know the, the state of the markets are way overdone here i mean basically gold is uh, even bitcoin to a certain degree uh we got overdone here uh, the greed index is way up there on the cnn uh tabulation everybody and his brother was panting over the uh nvidia earnings which came out as you know yesterday 
the whole world was waiting for NVIDIA. Meanwhile, uh, despite the fact NVIDIA was up today, the Dow was down 600 points. So um, market's overdone, and uh, my cycle work says down. So, you know, uh, you know, this applies to uh, probably pretty much all the markets across the board. Even the cannabis stocks were down. So I think we're just in a time frame where everybody got overly enthusiastic about, uh, you know, Bitcoin, gold, uh, you know, the whole the stock market in whole, and even NVIDIA. Um, even though it's up big today, I'm sure it's going to pull back here and it's going to provide another entry opportunity for those who, of course, there's a 10 for one split coming on that one. So everybody's excited about that. So it's a thousand dollars, but it'll be a hundred at some point. So it'll be quote unquote more affordable for the average investor. So, but even that stock needs to pull back, I think 40 or 50 points from here. So, um, I think we're just at a time frame where we're going to experience some more indigestion. What's happening with cryptocurrencies? Same thing, you know, just got overbought. I heard after the news today, in the news today, that Ethereum might have been approved by the SEC for an ETF. I think that was sort of hanging out there. Uh, we actually sold the Ethereum uh, ETF for one of our newsletters a couple of days ago because we had a huge profit in it. So who knows? Maybe I got to consider jumping back in. But there's a new story about their approval for an ETF. Of course, it was rallying on the anticipation of the ETF being approved. There was some worry that uh, Gary Gensler over at the uh, SEC was not going to cooperate on the e- ETH uh, um, uh, ETF, even though they did reluctantly on uh, the Bitcoin. Um, so, but I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, BlackRock is behind the uh, ETF uh, for Ethereum as well. So uh, that's pretty big muscle because they they're the biggest you know fund manager on the planet. So. Uh, that's the latest news there. Uh, very bullish overall. It's like anything else. You got to trade them or invest in them. You know, I mean, what's your time frame? You know, as a trader, I'm, I'm sort of on the sidelines here taking some profits, but if I need to jump back in, I'll do it. I think Bitcoin is headed somewhere like 80 to 90,000 level and it could do it between now and the end of the year. So I don't want to miss that. So I got to watch the charts really, uh, carefully or just short term. I just think all the markets across the board just got overly exuberant here. We just, uh, maybe going into a little bit of a summer correction. Anything interesting on the geocosmic front? Boy, the U.S. is being pummeled by uh, tornadoes. That's um, that's for sure. Um, and um, I'm, I want to pull up uh, another story, if I can find it, on the, um, the, uh, the atom uh, phenomenon. But, um, uh, yeah, the um, basically we've had, uh, you know, how, how do I explain it? It's almost if... if God is after uh, the central United States, <laughs> you know, and uh, or, you know, most of the uh, central part of the country, because it seems going on here. I thought it was just, you know, a few days, and then suddenly it turns out to be, um, you know, resuming again. And every time I turn on the Weather Channel, there's another stream of, um, you know, t- uh, tornadoes just p- p- plummeting the, uh, the country. So what is this? Is, is it government weather experiments? Um, it, we want, you know, what, what is going on? I mean, it's really, uh, it's just really crazy here. So, um, you know, there's a friend of mine, uh, Bill Koenig, who is, uh, used to be a White House correspondent and he's a very religious guy and he has a video which I posted on my, um, my website. And, you know, if you're not into that kind of stuff, you'll probably laugh and think the guy is crazy, but, you know, he thinks that the U.S. could be punished for doing certain things and, he ties this in with other events that have happened related to uh, the U.S. relationship to Israel and all kinds of fun stuff. And he's been putting out stuff the last few days, you know, pretty much saying, hey, look, you know, these tornadoes are a result of, of this, this fact that uh, we're not treating Israel correctly. So when I see his publications and I see the disasters and we see what happened with regard to the U.S. and Israel with withholding of weapons and so forth. You just wonder, is this guy totally crazy, or is uh, if you're religious, uh, God, God is involved in this? If you're not religious, then it's just uh, you know a geo cosmic event, and we get tornadoes all the time, and this is just another example of that. So, depends what your you know long term viewpoint rate is. Meanwhile, the solar activity, you know, di- died down a little bit in between our recent conversations. You know, we had the potential Carrington event here on the U.S or the planet, I should say, and it didn't really come to fore, though we did see shortwave radio um, terminated in some areas, and uh, Eli Musk said that his Earthling satellites weren't damaged, so that was good. But I came across this thing called the Adams event, 
which was new to me and maybe was familiar to you, Jim. But apparently, 41,000 years ago, we had, uh, you know, basically uh, direction, uh, you know, polar, not a polar shift, but magnetic pole changed direction. So it wobbled a little bit, and then uh, apparently um, it caused havoc on the planet. And, um, you know, we've been sort of speculating about crazy things, you know, like super volcanoes going off or shift in the uh, axis of the planet. But there was actually a documentation of this thing called the Adams, the Adams event. And, uh, it's real interesting reading we posted on the, uh, on the website. So, you know, 41,000 years seems like, you know, forever, but not in geologic time. But I just think that's interesting. You know, we do have risks. I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, you got uh, the solar uh, CMEs that, uh, you know, we just experienced. Uh, it could have been a Carrington event. And that would have, you know, nothing else would have mattered at that point. All everything, communications have been shut down. It could have been really serious. Uh, so right after that event, it turned out that there were some sun. See, apparently the sunspots, the direction they point on the sun is where the... Uh, you know, the emissions direct themselves and affect other parts of the solar system. So apparently right after ours, um, the spaceweather.com reported uh, sunspots that were pointing toward the planet Mars. So, you know, apparently Mars got something here in recent days from the same or another sunspot on the uh, sun, you know, again, that direction where, so it doesn't just point outward to everybody. Apparently it's somewhat intense and directed. So I thought that was fascinating. So there's uh, no coverage or really discussion about it per se, and obviously we can't predict it. And uh, but you know, obviously, if you believe this is uh, a time frame of higher solar activity, then you might want to consider protecting your equipment or uh, storing up food or providing some alternate sources of energy to protect yourself because you know it's just not asteroids and stuff like that, or you know, uh, you know, China or North Korea or somebody setting up. Uh, Exploding an atomic bomb in the atmosphere to, uh, you know, cut, you know, sh- shut down our communications. It could be very much natural events. So, just interesting stuff uh, out there right now. It appears quiet, except for the tornadoes in the mid U.S. and the bad weather, which doesn't seem to be stopping. So, um, if you have a chance, go to my website and look at the video. Well, uh, I think the U.S. has produced. yeah, yeah, your website. I'm sorry, I vrtrader.com. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think trader. the U.S. Anyway, has the worst weather in the world because you're stuck between cold Canada, a big landmass, and then uh, you know the influence of hot air coming up from the Caribbean and Mexico. And you swirl them right, together, and right. you get tornadoes. <laughs> and it could all be nothing more than that. Yeah, it just that uh, it's been so intense. Just recent days, in a couple of weeks, you know, it wasn't um, a bunch of storms coming through and passing. It just doesn't mm-hmm. seem to end. It seems like I may still be going on today, for all I know. I mean, honestly, mm-hmm. I watch the Weather Channel all the time and consider myself an amateur meteorologist ever since I've been a kid. I guess that's why I got the stock market forecasting because I used to for- forecast the weather too. Yeah, another <laughs> inflation alert. I, I, yeah, and and an inflation alert here. A uh, sudden container crunch sends ocean freight rates soaring up to 30%. And uh, they say back to school supplies and so on could be affected. So get your back to school supplies now as the kids are getting out of school. <laughs> well, there's just a shortage of shipping that, containers. So that, that's a strong economic sign in terms of business yeah. and the, in the world economy, you know. So yeah. despite our fear of going into a recession or lower or higher rates, uh, Business is doing well out there, and I think that's what is worrying uh, the interest rate um, people at the Fed. You know whether you know business is really all that good, and you know maybe we need to keep things restrictive because uh, which which you know I'm more in the camp about the, the abolishment. I, I know we didn't cover that on this uh, interview, but you know as you know, uh, don't know in the last few days a bill was introduced in the U.S. Congress, um, and um, it's called the Abolition Act. And it was pro- proposed by Senator Massey, one of the U.S. senators, and uh, basically looks to uh, abolish the Federal Reserve, which is something which was attempted back, I think, in 2013 when the former uh, Congressman Ron Paul initiated a similar bill. because that was in the House, and that went nowhere. So apparently somebody is taking this seriously. And, uh, of course, we need to abolish Congress, too, in my opinion, considering the way they 
you know, spent money and have been so irresponsible. But they do have the power to abolish the Federal Reserve if they if they choose to do that. It, it, it's not going to go anywhere, but I'm, I'm all supportive of it. So I cover that in my newsletter as well, since I'm a big follower of the um, G. Edward Griffin book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which uh, basically talks about the creation and problems at the Federal Reserve, which I think we already know about already. So interesting times, Jim. Yeah, the uh, shipping container shortage uh, apparently caused by uh, longer transits due to shipping avoiding the Red Sea and the Houthi missiles there and bad weather in Asia. So this wasn't planned or expected, but it's happening. And, and it's funny because it's not only related to oil. You would think that oil was the, um, you know, the beneficiary for higher prices, and now we're hearing about school supplies. It's amazing. Yeah. Remember the ship that got caught in the... Uh, Suez Canal. And, yeah, it and caused the, a um, shortage of uh, garden gnomes and sex toys in Europe. <laughs> right. It's amazing stuff that's on these ships, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's everything. There's Afraid everything of, on them. You can, everything on So now, now it's not only oil coming out of the Mideast. There's all these other fun toys on those ships, too. It's funny. Really great story. Mark, thank you so much for chatting with us. Always fun. Back to you next week. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. If you have any questions for Mark or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on X at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.